Marcaic translation by H.T. Francis and R.A. Neil. Jataka No. 316. Sasa Jataka. Seven Red Fish, etc. This story was told by the Master while living at Jitavana Monastery, about a gift of all the Buddhist necessities. A certain landowner at Trivasthi City. They say. Provided all the necessities for the brotherhood with Buddha at its head. And setting up a pavilion at his house door. He invited all the company of elder monks with their chief Buddha, seated them on elegant seats prepared for them, and offered them a variety of choice and elegant food. And saying, come again tomorrow, he entertained them for a whole week, and on the seventh day he presented Buddha and the five hundred elder monks under him with all the necessities. At the end of the feast the master, in returning thanks, said, lay disciple, you are right in giving goodwill and satisfaction by this charity. For this is a tradition of wise men of old, who sacrificed their lives for any beggars they met with, and gave them even their own flesh to eat. And at the request of his host he told this old world legend. Once upon a time when Brahmadatta was reigning in Banaras, the Bodhisattva came to life as a young hare and lived in a wood. On one side of this wood was the foot of a mountain, on another side a river, and on the third side a border village. The hare had three friends a monkey, a jackal, and an otter. These four wise creatures lived together and each of them got his food on his own hunting ground, and in the evening they again came together. The hare in his wisdom by way of advice preached the truth to his three companions, teaching that alms are to be given, the moral law to be observed, and holy days to be kept. They accepted his advice and went each to his own part of the jungle and lived there. And so in the course of time the Bodhisattva one day observing the sky. And looking at the moon knew that the next day would be a fast day, and addressing his three companions he said, Tomorrow is a fast day. Let all three of you take upon you the moral rules, and observe the holy day. To one that stands fast in moral practice, almsgiving brings a great reward. Therefore feed any beggars that come to you by giving them food from your own table. They readily agreed, and dwelling each in his own place of living. On the next day quite early in the morning, the otter swiftly moved on to seek his prey and went down to the bank of the Ganges. Now it came to pass that a fisherman had landed seven red fish, and stringing them together on a withe, he had taken and buried them in the sand on the river's bank. And then he dropped down the stream, catching more fish. The otter scenting the buried fish, dug up the sand till he came upon them, and pulling them out cried aloud thrice, Does anyone own these fish? And not seeing any owner he took hold of the withe with his teeth and laid the fish in the jungle where he lived, intending to eat them at a fitting time. And then he lay down, thinking how virtuous he was. The jackal too swiftly moved on in quest of food and found in the hut of a field watcher two roasted pieces of meat, a lizard, and a pot of milk curd. And after thrice crying aloud, to whom do these belong? And not finding an owner. He put on his neck the rope for lifting the pot. And grasping the roasted pieces of meat and the lizard with his teeth. He brought and laid them in his own lair, thinking, in due season I will devour them, and so lay down, thinking how virtuous he had been. The monkey also entered the clump of trees. And gathering a bunch of mangoes laid them up in his part of the jungle, meaning to eat them in due season, and then lay down, thinking how virtuous he was. But the bodhisattva in due time came out, intending to feed on the kisha grass. And as he lay in the jungle, the thought occurred to him, it is impossible for me to offer grass to any beggars that may chance to appear, and I have no oil or rice and such like. If any beggar shall appeal to me, I shall have to give him my own flesh to eat. At this splendid display of virtue, Sokka's white marble throne manifested signs of heat. Sokka with insight, discovered the cause and resolved to put this royal hair to the test. First of all he went and stood by the otter's living place. Disguised as a Brahmin, and being asked why he stood there, he replied, Wise sir, if I could get something to eat, after keeping the fast, I would perform all my priestly duties. The otter replied, Very well, I will give you some food, 
and as he talked with him he repeated the first stanza. Seven red fish I safely brought to land from Ganges' flood, O Brahmin, eat your fill, I request, and stay within this wood. The Brahmin said, Let be till tomorrow. I will see to it in due course. Next he went to the jackal, and when asked by him why he stood there, he made the same answer. The jackal, too, readily promised him some food, and in talking with him repeated the second stanza. A lizard and a jar of curds, the keeper's evening meal, two roasted pieces of meat in addition I wrongfully did steal. Such as I have I give to you. O Brahmin, eat, I request, if you should oblige within this wood a while with us to stay. Said the Brahmin, let be till tomorrow. I will see to it in due course. Then he went to the monkey, and when asked what he meant by standing there, he answered just as before. The monkey readily offered him some food, and in conversing with him gave utterance to the third stanza. An icy stream, a mango ripe, and pleasant greenwood shade, it is yours to enjoy, if you can dwell content in forest glade. Said the Brahmin, let be till tomorrow. I will see to it in due course. And he went to the wise hare, and on being asked by him why he stood there, he made the same reply. The Bodhisattva on hearing what he wanted was highly delighted, and said, Brahmin, you have done well in coming to me for food. This day will I grant you a boon that I have never granted before, but you shall not break the moral law by taking animal life. Go. Friend. And when you have piled together logs of wood. And kindled a fire, come and let me know, and I will sacrifice myself by falling into the midst of the flames, and when my body is roasted, you shall eat my flesh and fulfill all your priestly duties. And in thus addressing him the hare uttered the fourth stanza. Nor sesame, nor beans, nor rice have I as food to give, but roast with fire my flesh I yield, if you with us would live. Saka, on hearing what he said, by his miraculous power caused a heap of burning coals to appear, and came, and told the Bodhisattva. Rising from his bed of kishagrass and coming to the place, he thrice shook himself that if there were any insects within his coat, they might escape death. Then offering his whole body as a free gift he sprang up, and like a royal swan, descending on a cluster of lotuses, in an ecstasy of joy he fell on the heap of live coals. But the flame failed even to heat the pores of the hair on the body of the Bodhisattva, and it was as if he had entered a region of frost. Then he addressed Saka in these words. Brahmin, the fire you have kindled is icy cold. It fails to beat even the pores of the hair on my body. What is the meaning of this? Wise sir, he replied, I am no Brahmin. I am Saka, and I have come to put your virtue to the test. The Bodhisattva said. If not only you. Saka. But all the inhabitants of the world were to try me in this matter of almsgiving. They would not find in me any unwillingness to give, and with this the Bodhisattva uttered a cry of delight like a lion roaring. Then said Saka to the Bodhisattva, O wise hare, he your virtue known throughout a whole one. And squeezing the mountain, with the essence thus extracted, he painted the sign of a hare on the face of the moon. And after depositing the hare on a bed of young kisha grass, in the same wooded part of the jungle, Saka returned to his own place in heaven. And these four wise creatures lived happily and harmoniously together, fulfilling the moral law and observing holy days, till they departed to fare according to their deeds. The master, when he had ended his lesson, revealed the truths and identified the birth. At the conclusion of the truths the householder, who gave as a free gift all the Buddhist necessities, attained fruition of the first path. At that time Ananda was the otter, Magalyana was the jackal, Saraputra the monkey, and I myself was the wise hare. Source Adapted from Archaic Translation by H.T. Francis and R.A. Neil. Jataka No. 317. Madaradana Jataka. Weep for the living, etc. The master while in residence at Jitavana Monastery told the story of a certain landowner who lived at Shrivasthi city. On the death of his brother, it is said, 
he was so overwhelmed with grief that he neither ate nor washed nor anointed himself, but in deep sorrow he used to go to the cemetery at daybreak to weep. The Master Early in the morning setting his eye upon the world and observing in that man a capacity for attaining to the fruition of the first path. Thought, there is no one but myself that can, by telling him what happened long ago, relieve his grief and bring him to the fruition of the first path. I must be his refuge. So next day on returning in the afternoon from his round of alms begging, he took a junior monk and went to his house. On hearing of the master's arrival, the landowner ordered a seat to be prepared and asked him to enter, and saluting him he sat on one side. In answer to the master, who asked him why he was grieving, he said he had been sorrowing ever since his brother's death. Said the master, all worldly existences are impermanent, and what is to be broken is broken. One should not make a trouble of this. Wise men of old, from knowing this, did not grieve, when their brother died. And at his request the master told this legend of the past. Once upon a time when Brahmadatta was reigning in Banaras, the Bodhisattva was reborn in the family of a rich merchant, worth eighty crores. When he was come of age, his parents died. And on their death a brother of the Bodhisattva managed the family estate. And the Bodhisattva lived in dependence on him. In due course of time the brother also died of a fatal disease. His relations, friends and companions came together, and throwing up their arms wept and mourned, and no one was able to control his feelings. But the Bodhisattva neither mourned nor wept. Men said, see now, though his brother is dead, he does not so much as pull a wry face. He is a very hard-hearted fellow. I think he desired his brother's death, hoping to enjoy a double portion. Thus did they blame the Bodhisattva. His family too rebuked him, saying, Though your brother is dead, you do not shed a tear. On hearing their words he said, In your blind wrongdoing, not knowing the eight worldly conditions, you weep and cry, Alas! My brother is dead, but I too, and you also, will have to die. Why then do you not weep at the thought of your own death? All existing things are transient, and consequently no single substance is able to remain in its natural condition. Though you, blind fools, in your state of ignorance, from not knowing the eight worldly conditions, weep and cry, why should I weep? And so saying, he repeated these stanzas. Weep for the living rather than the dead. All creatures that a mortal form do take, four-footed beast and bird and hooded snake, yes men and angels all the same path walk. Powerless to cope with fate, rejoice to die, midst sad vicissitude of bliss and pain, why shedding idle tears should man complain, and plunged in sorrow for a brother sigh. Men versed in fraud and in excess grown old, the untutored fool, even valiant men of might, if worldly wise and ignorant of right, wisdom itself as foolishness may hold. Thus did the Bodhisattva teach these men the truth, and delivered them all from their sorrow. The Master, after he had ended his Dhammic exposition, revealed the truths and identified the birth. At the conclusion of the truths the landowner attained to fruition of the first path, at that time the wise man who by his righteous exposition delivered people from their sorrow was I myself.